I'll do a quick introduction of us all and our panel. I am Amelia Chesley, uh, Caroline Coons, and I are at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona, as is our fourth panelist, Phil Chaveau, who's going to be a little bit late, so you'll see him pop in. And Dr. John Adams has been with us, but recently transferred over to uh, West Point. So he and Phil make a podcast about video games and academia called Professors Play. Um, I do some student mentoring with podcasts myself, and I also record for LibriVox, do a lot of audiobook stuff when I can. And Caroline is our, our resident music and ethics and speech scholar. So we're glad to have this group all together. And I'll get my screen shared with our slides so that we can do a little overview and then just hop in. We've, we've all um, committed to keep our, our individual talks pretty short so that there's lots of room for discussion at the end of the panel. So again, thanks all for being here. We are Best Practices for Accessibility and Media Literacy, which is gonna encompass, let's see if, oh, it's so slow pokey. Slide, there we go. We've got three talks on this theme. I'm gonna start uh, talking about podcasting transcripts and what makes them good or not so good. Caroline will go in and kind of extend some of that, talking about specifically how do you best transcribe non-linguistic sounds, non-verbal types of things. And uh, then Phil and John together will take us on a whirlwind tour of AI and podcasting accessibility tools with that and how it can be used. So I will get us started. I I'm a little obsessed with podcast transcripts. I love podcasts, as I'm sure most of us do, um, but I really, really appreciate transcripts, and I've made that my whole research focus of late, partly because I find them very useful. It's comforting to me when there is a transcript in case I want to reference it, quote it, make sure I'm spelling that person's name right or whatever. But obviously, and I'm taking it for granted here, that pod or transcripts are valuable for many other reasons as well, especially for those who uh, cannot hear or hard of hearing. They can also, as many scholars have been uh, talking about, um, Sean Zdenek, Michael Ferris, uh, Kyle Stedman, and uh, Courtney Danforth, <laughs> I'm remembering names. Uh, they've done a lot of work on how transcripts and the multimedia relationships between audio and writing that's a great site for creative and critical design work and a, a, a place for more self-expression, more rhetorical efficacy can happen there. Um, and from my past research, I, I have learned that only about not even 20% of most popular podcasts actually uh, provide an official transcript. It's very rare. So this is one of those cases where it's not valuable because it's rare, but it is it happens to be so rare, even though it's it's so valuable. And I think it's so worthwhile to be pushing for more inclusive podcasting spaces. Learning, teaching about quality transcripts is worthwhile and valuable. And I'm excited to to share with you some of the things I've learned, what we can do with them, and why it matters. For this particular study, I sample 36 transcripts just to see what are people already doing and what's the quality what's the range can we learn anything can we create a taxonomy of sorts a, a rubric of sorts for what's quality podcast transcripts and what is not so these were sampled from my earlier research from like 200 different podcasts but only about 36 of them actually had a transcript that i could download print out and then I did a close listening and a content analysis of all of those transcripts. So where were they different, the audio and the text? Uh, what was missing from the text? Uh, what matched surprisingly well? Um, were there any other random notable features that showed up that were interesting? So I took lots of notes, scribbled and highlighted all over my printouts, and then tried to take stock um, and think about how are these transcripts being made available? Uh, what are, what file formats are they in? And then can we rank them? Can we start to sort of rank the quality? And uh, most were HTML. A lot of people 
um, just put a web page, HTML transcript, um, a few PDFs in there, a couple Word documents, one little lonely Google Doc, and then a few of the podcasts that I looked at did did provide multiple file formats, so HTML and a PDF, for example. As for quality, uh, most of this sample I decided was average. And I'll talk more about how I rank these and like the criteria in a minute. But uh, 50, half of them kind of average. They, they were at least trying. About a third were completely apathetic. I found those were the, the AI generated, just slapped up. It's a transcript, but it's very hard to follow, not very accurate, very difficult without the audio to know what is happening in this piece of content. And then only four of my 36 sample. So it's a small sample, small group that, that I thought were even more impressive and more, more showed more care and intention and put more effort than just an average sort of decent transcript. And we'll look at, I wanna look with you at some of these examples in a minute, but first we'll go over what the criteria are that I determined uh, that a careful, intentional, like a really, really good A plus transcript should do these things. And even the four that I highlighted uh, and that we'll look at in a minute, they don't do all of these things perfectly. There's no such thing as perfect, right? But as long as we're working towards this, as long as there's some effort shown, that, that that's what I used as my guideline. And this is my uh, little checklist, I guess. The rubric for a really excellent transcript uh, should include some useful metadata. A lot of them, a lot of them sort of skip that, assuming maybe if you're printing out this transcript, you already know that it's for this show, or it was released on this date, or you got it from this website. But um, it's useful to still include that titles, dates, URLs, timestamps as well can be helpful for people navigating the transcript. Speaker identifier is very important, and that's one thing that the AI generated transcripts just don't always. You usually have to put those in separately somehow, or it's just speaker one, speaker A, speaker B, which is just not informative enough. Uh, next is the importance of balancing readability and accuracy. None of us speaks in perfectly standard gram grammatical English sentences. And so uh, representing speech accurately can be hard to read and balancing that out, smoothing out disfluencies and things like that is usually necessary for a good transcript, but you don't want to go too far and change what people are saying, how people sound. So that's a challenge. Representing significant non-speech. So that could be music or sound effects, paralanguage, laughter, things like that. And that's something Caroline's going to talk a little bit more about in her presentation in a minute. The next couple are just about formatting. Like I said, uh, we don't speak in perfect sentences with punctuation and such, but when we read, we appreciate those things as readers. So putting some of that formatting in in a meaningful way is valuable. And then same with paragraph level page formatting. A lot of the AI generated transcripts, they don't break things up into paragraphs. It's one speaker and the only line break is when the next speaker comes in. So if someone's speaking for a very long time, it's a long paragraph, hard to read. The last couple are about distinguishing different audio channels. So archival tape, scene tape, interview tape, narration, all of those might have a different sound to them or it might be important for um, readers who aren't hearing the audio to know that this is the hosts in the studio, this is the hosts out in the field, and, and know where the different audio is coming from and representing that in text for your transcript is valuable. And then a kind of an optional one, this last one is uh, credits, copyrights, or other enhancements. A few of the samples that I looked at had links to things, kind of like citations thrown in throughout the transcript or additional speaker information like bios or profiles or photographs, things like that. But that can't be in the audio or usually aren't in the audio, but can be helpful to have in your transcript. So all of this together is like gold standard, <laughs> great, great transcript. And uh, let me get out of presentation mode and we'll look at some examples. So the first one here is from Lingthusiasm, a great podcast. And this is this one was borderline for me in my 
categorization. So it's an example of one that sort of seems average, but is pushing towards more intentional, more carefully crafted. Uh, we have markers for music, but not a description of like, what does the music sound like or what actual song is it? They do have a disclaimer at the top about this has been lightly edited. So they're definitely taking into consideration the readability factor. And it's a good start. These other three go even further and I'll just highlight a few quick things. We have descriptions of the music. We have timestamps. Um, we have a PDF and this HTML version depending on what we might need, which is great. The end of this, the experiment, the end of this experiment is their final episode. And I grabbed their transcript to analyze and they are one of the only shows that credit their transcriptionist, which I think is important <laughs> because as, as we all, if we've tried to transcribe anything well, it takes a lot of work. So recognizing that work is so important. The transcript itself was one of the most impressive as well. A lot of description of the sound effects, the montage, the, the audio that we hear behind the vocals. Uh, we have markers of tone here emphatically. They not just, well, sometimes just that he laughs, but sometimes radiant laugh or laughs gently and who is laughing. So a lot of attention to detail here. It was just pretty amazing. So bonus points to their transcriptionist. But there are a lot of different ways of doing transcripts. Here's another HTML one from Freakonomics Radio that skips, it skips the speaker uh, markers, speaker identifiers for the main host, because I guess it's up here in like, by Stephen Jub Dubner. Uh, but they do a great job of identifying different audio channels. So we've got the narration and then the clips from their interviews. So just a, a range of examples there. Uh, and just for the sake of time, where are we? I'll keep my 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 last two slides pretty quick. This this definitely matters. I think given um, how much the symposium, a lot of people have been talking about access, accessibility, and transcripts so far. So I, I know that most of you agree that this is important, it's valuable to teach about and to put some thought and effort into, even though definitely it is a lot of work. Start wherever you are if you're a podcast creator and need to, to get on the transcript bandwagon. Um, ask for help, just get get going. There's lots of AI options for, for getting a basic transcript. I also think we can put more, um, put more pressure on our favorite podcasters and ask for transcripts if they aren't already providing them in an accessible way reach out and say, hey, I want to be able to read this episode too, so or I want to access this in a transcript way. Can you send it and see if that can start start something? In the future, I definitely want to do more research and uh, reach out to people who use transcripts in ways differently from how I do, find out more about their needs and their preferences. I want to push my research out to more folks. Um, keep sharing why this matters and how to best create transcripts. A lot of what I've presented today is going to be in a new edited collection on diversifying podcasts. So whenever that gets published, hopefully we can learn from it as well. Um, I wonder if we could create a best transcript award for people, for podcasts that do create really good transcripts like The Experiment. Just keep raising awareness, keep putting pressure on uh, our fellow podcasters to at least at least try. We can we can definitely do better. So that's mine. I'll turn the I'll turn the screen over to Caroline next. But there right. you go. <laughs> Take it away. I will do so in just a moment. Once I there we go. I think. Oh. that showing for you guys all right thank you all for being here i'm going to build on what amelia said amelia is talking about let's just provide transcripts and get more of them i'm going to say let's extend that a little bit more and see how we can do transcripts a little bit better for 
accounting for some of these non-speech linguistic sounds. So I'm talking about how do we transcribe non-linguistic sounds. I'm going to talk about what the variety of those is. My background, I'm a public speaking teacher and I teach ethics and communication apprehension in particular. So that's the background that I'm coming from and why I think maybe including verbal fillers among other things might in fact be a good thing. So let's figure out what exactly we're talking about first. Communication is more than just the words that are said. There's any number of sounds that are made intentionally or not that resist linguistic codes, but still communicate nonetheless. Figuring out how to capture that which is inherently non-linguistic without going outside the bounds of language can be difficult, and even more so when you're attempting to transcribe podcasts for accessibility. But at the same time, accessibility requires concision. We have to balance between describing sound and efficient use of language. Got to balance between what's said and what is unsaid, but still part of the process without losing train of what is actually being said or being communicated or part of this process, but recognizing still something is always going to be lost. This is an imperfect art. And as Amelia said, you cannot include absolutely everything because you only have so much space, time, and attention to work off of. So we need some best practices in order to maximize this descriptive efficiency. So what exactly are non-linguistic sounds anyways, and why are they important? The ones that we're probably most familiar with are verbal fillers, the ums, uh, so, like, uh, other vocal placeholders we have. And we have these very intentionally in our language development. They signal our thought patterns. They hold our place. They show others that our brains and our mouths are not as in sync as we might wish. We think about three times faster than we can speak, and there's always going to be some disconnect or place, and particularly in Western speech patterns, we have these verbal fillers that get incorporated into our speech patterns to show that we're not quite caught up or done speaking yet. We aren't comfortable with silence in the way that some other cultures are, but we still wanna hold that place. And so those ums, uhs, likes are that non-linguistic signifier that we aren't quite there yet, but still have thoughts following through. We also have vocal sounds, the ticks, mouth noises, inhales, exhales, sighs, murmurs, ascents, whatever other grumblings, even whatever the heck I just did. Uh, they show the physicality of speech acts, the complicated process of using an entire body to communicate and try and get the linguistic codes put into this physical signaling in some way or another. There's also background sounds like the click of a keyboard, street noise, the conversation going on in the office next to me, which I'm not sure if it's being picked up on the microphone or not. But you also bird songs, ambient noises, ambiance that helps set the scene, chatter behind an interviewer that shows this is a street recording or any number of other things. They indicate this environment that exists outside of these voices in isolation, which when John and Phil talk about AI generated podcasts, some of that doesn't exist and sounds strange because we don't have that outside background sound as a component part of it. But there's also intentional sound effects. You've got like the radio DJ keyboard of sound effects to put in and many others that we use deliberately to enhance the engagement of the listening experience beyond just voices. And of course, there's clips of music that we include that may be able to be identified by a title or author or not. There's plenty of songs that we don't know the name of, but we recognize them, or we don't recognize them at all, but identify them based on mood or what they're trying to do. These can set mood, transition segments, signal beginnings, ends, any other function of coherence for a podcast. We need these non-linguistic sounds, and neglecting them from a transcript loses a lot from the listening experience. So why not just leave them out? It certainly makes it easier, uh, but these non-linguistic sounds serve a function. For transcription and accessibility, often it comes down to these judgments of significance. Is it significant or not? And I'm gonna argue we need a wider span of what it actually is significant for. Because what they can signal varies widely, particularly when put into patterns, these non-linguistic sounds are important communicative acts, whether they're intentional or not. A series of verbal fillers is showing that 
they're not quite sure what you want to say yet. And that can be an important context for somebody who is looking only at a transcript or encountering media only through the written rather than the audio. My policy and what I'm going to advocate on behalf of is when in doubt, it's better to include than omit. Over sanitized transcripts reduce meaning making opportunities. You're making choices for an audience and not allowing them the opportunity to do so for themselves. Filtering out on behalf of somebody else reduces the ability to make meaning on their own. Non linguistic sounds, whether we want them or not, whether they are intentionally put there or not, can make the difference between reading a play and watching and hearing it performed live. It's a produced whole, it's part of the whole experience. So, then what are the accessibility guidelines as they currently exist? I did a deep dive into what actually people recommend and say. And if you've done any research into this, you know it's a little sparse on the ground. Legal requirements usually combine audio and audiovisual media together, and they tend to focus much more towards like closed captioning on TV as opposed to like audio only based experiences. They do it for like live performances at like a concert venue, but don't really account for podcast sorts of context. They tend to focus more on visual descriptors and ignore those non linguistic sounds entirely prioritizing closed captioning, haven't quite caught up to audio-based media. But those that do focus on what Amelia just talked about, let's get more transcripts, let's have more of them and make them accessible and findable, but don't really focus on what exactly those transcripts should contain in detail. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is an organization, they say provide a transcript for any audio or visual media. So Amelia's got us on track there. The Bureau of Internet Accessibility recommends not including filler words unless they're important, but they don't tell you what important might be. And I think we need a more expansive definition of what important is. And they say, but quote, if the speaker is stammering because he's nervous or excited, the filler words might convey something important. So opening up, up more interpretation for the communicative act of these non-speech sounds. So Brandeis University, they have, I guess, perhaps the most expansive guidelines here. And these are specifically for descriptive transcripts. They recommend including important, again, what the heck is important, audio cues or sound effects. But they say, ask yourself, does leaving this out, sorry, does leaving out the sound change the story, lesson, or experience? And I think that experience is really the key point. What is the experience of listening and how can we get the transcript as close to a shared experience. So then, as part of all of this, we have to consider audience. Amelia touched on this briefly. I'm gonna expand on it a little bit more and say we gotta consider who actually uses transcripts. Yes, they are wonderful resources for folks who are deaf or hard of hearing, but that's not the only way that they're used. They're used by people who don't have time to listen or who will skim a transcript. Uh, there was a study, I meant to find the full citation, but ran out of time, that showed that students who are assigned podcasts in class, about 70% of them will use a transcript as an augmentation to their learning experience. Also, folks who are not proficient in the language the podcast is in may find it easier to read than to listen or put the two together as part of the language learning experience. Folks who have low, low bandwidth connections or who pay per bandwidth usage uh, Text-based media is going to be far, far cheaper and easier than getting the full audio file. And of course, people who cannot play the audio because of environment or technology access, you forgot your headphones, or you're in a crowded space, or in the case of when I did some of my podcast consumption, I'm holding a baby that I don't want to wake up, and so I'm reading the transcript because I don't want to play the audio. There's a number of ways that these transcripts can be used, and we don't want to reduce meaning making for that. Plus, as other folks in this symposium talked about, it can add more traffic to the information through SEO, easier linking, easier quoting, all that good stuff. So there's a number of reasons to do this. I will wrap up then with some suggested best practices for non-linguistic sounds in audio transcripts. How do we actually do this and what do we need to have as some additional considerations? We've got to consider the difference between naming and describing. We've got to have a balance. I might say Pachelbel's canon, and you might be able to recall what that sound is or not. 
but for folks who may have never heard Pachelbel's Canon, don't have the um, music literacy to back it up, a descriptor might do more for conveying the tone and what that inclusion does for the podcast as a whole. What is it communicating beyond just a title and composer in the case of music? We also have to consider things like structure and form. So Trevor Herbert's Music and Words and Sean Zendek's Reading Sound are really helpful resources here. So we have to consider what's the origin of the sound? Is it known? Is it implied? Is there texture, rhythm, contrast, echoes, moods, tone, or other concise descriptors that can help us efficiently get to that describing and enriching the text beyond just language? And in doing that kind of descriptive thing, we have to also consider composition and performance context. So for music, it's not just a matter of who wrote it and who performed it or what the title is. It's also where is it performed, by whom, in what context, what's the quality of the sound and the resonance uh, by a single performer versus an entire orchestra makes a huge difference in what that uh, audio is actually doing. And then because we're using language to describe, make full uses of language with dense descriptors. Limit yourself to one or two adjectives. You don't want a whole string in the like seventh grade descriptive scene kind of context. Uh, you do still need to make sure that those descriptors are not bogging down the flow of the whole productive thing, but really marshalling the full resources of language is going to help get to some of that dense description. For those that are using AI or auto transcription services, because any transcript is better than no transcript most almost all the time. Amelia might quibble with me on that one. Uh, but double checking and augmenting that transcript to add to it is going to help quite a bit. But also you have to consider how assistive technologies will interpret these non-linguistic sounds. What is a screen reader or something like that going to do with this transcript? Delineating through brackets and parentheticals helps distinguish what is speech sound from non-speech sound. So making use of not just descriptive language, but also punctuation as well adds a lot. But we also have to be careful not to go overboard because there have been some cases where folks take some of this descriptive a little bit too far to the point that it is getting to commentary or humorous additions to a transcript that are adding meaning that does not exist and in fact, interprets or interpolates something onto the transcript that does not exist on its own. So we've got to consider how phonetic slang wordplay can be difficult to transcribe, but not muddying the waters further. It's a complicated middle ground that it's easy to go one direction or the other. But my advocacy is going to be consider these non-linguistic sounds, what they do, and there is a lot of meaning that comes from not just language and not just music those verbal fillers, as much as we might wish they go away, actually serve a really important function and add a lot to the podcast experience as a whole. All right, I will hand it over to John, I think. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I am uh, excited to be here to talk. I, I think that we talked with Amelia a little bit about how we should sort of shape our transcripts and our AI so that people can understand humans even when they don't have necessarily all the accessibility that's there. Um, then Caroline moved us even further away with sort of non-linguistic sounds or these speech sounds. Now we're gonna move as far away as we possibly can uh, from elements of the human here. And we're gonna talk a little bit about AI tools in podcasts. And to be clear, let me share this. Share sound. Here. Can everybody see? Excellent. Uh, to be clear, what we're talking about here isn't sort of AI tools used for transcription or AI tools used for ChatGPT. We are actually talking about podcasts generated completely by AI sources uh, and by uh, AI altogether. So my name is uh, Dr. Jonathan Adams. I work at the United States Military Academy at West Point, uh, but I used to be colleagues with these wonderful people here at ERAU. And uh, my colleague, Phil Chaveau, is here, and he uh, sort of helped to work with and program this language model. Uh, we're both professors of humanities and communication. Uh, Phil specializes in speech, and I specialize in rhetoric. So we like to think about how language is constructed, 
even when it's not constructed by people. So, of course, AI has sort of become everywhere all at once, right? Uh, we've, we've seen it in ChatGPT, we see it in uh, deep thinking and language models. And when we say AI, I really do hear me not sort of like advanced artificial intelligence, but just a large language model or a, or a model where you take inputs, tell the computer to learn from enacting those inputs, and then respec out uh, a finalized input that is different from what exists before. Uh, all these models have sort of evolved over the years, and now they can not only do text, but they can do art and word and video, and we now see them doing advanced voice. Uh, and so it wasn't long before you could do advanced voice that you'd start to see podcasts emerge. Uh, Scarlett Johansson actually recently sued ChatGPT because they were using her voice. Uh, and so there is some discussion about like whose voice gets used and how much voice gets used. Uh, but we're going to skip past a little bit of that today to talk about what is happening currently. So give you a sort of a history of where things have come and how fast they're moving. Speech to text which is not an AI or a large language model. It is just uh, computer inputs registering or reading a dictionary of pre-ascribed sounds. Uh, Real quick, John. These yeah. Slides, there's like black squares all over the slides. Is that, I don't know. Oh, what interesting. They are not on my end at all. So that is, that's fascinating. The AI um, glitchiness. John, by, by any chance, might that be where your Zoom controls are showing up? Maybe. Let uh, me just... You uh, might have to just hide the panel or hide the Zoom tools. Let me do that real fast. I am so sorry yeah, about the black Thanks for screens. bringing that up. Hopefully it's a quick fix. Um, so if I just say hide all together? I believe so. And then share. Yeah. Yeah, that looks a little better. The top still has, yeah, but hopefully it'll go away. How's that? Much better. Much better. Yeah, there's a little, but we can Fixed work it. with anything. Interesting what you can only see on your side versus what other people see. Uh, that's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, so we have text to speech in 1995. Uh, that comes through, but that is not sort of AI. What that program is doing is it's reading a dictionary list of entries with pre-recorded -pre sounds. So they recorded the sound for every single word that it could say. Uh, and then it analyzes those and spits them back out. And as it got better, it was able to sort of merge sounds, but it wasn't actually doing sort of independent learning. Uh, we first see sort of independent learning, what we would now call AI, uh, from Siri in 2011, uh, and a little earlier with Xbox Connect and the recognition of those voice sounds, where it's actually able to construct libraries of sounds, reference them all together, and then make it sound sort of human. This gets evolved even further with Alexa, who's able to do that and reference sort of the internet databases or even shopping databases on Amazon. And finally, Google's Assistant comes out in 2016, uh, and Google's newest assistant, Gemini, is actually an AI, which means that there is some sort of black box to the language model where they have taught it parameters and told it to cross-reference those parameters, but it is the creators aren't always fully aware of which parameters it's cross-referencing at a given moment, which makes it a large learning model uh, and what we would call AI. So all of these are fascinating, but the tool that we I really want to talk about today that Phil and I are here to talk about is called Notebook LM. It is described as a virtual research assistant. It comes out of Google, uh, Google's AI cloud and AI users, and it was dedicated from here. And what it was meant to be was it was meant to be an insight generating program. So you would upload a source, a document in the notebook, then the AI would scan the document and it would be able to spit out originally a paragraph, not in uh, audio form, but in written form, that sort of gives you the key takeaways of what you had read. So the assumption here is that like, and it could be used as an accessibility tool for students, that they would be able to take a textbook or a series of lecture notes uh, and input it in to the discussion. Phil is here. He was having some difficulties earlier with communication, but he should be able to join us very shortly. Uh, then the AI uses the documents to put it out, but it's supposed to reference and synthesize aspects of the documents too. So if it sees like a trend or a theme reoccurring in the document, it will automatically put forward. One limitation here is it won't find anything unless the document has that information with some exceptions. Um, it does have an external database or library that it is pulling from. And we'll talk about how we know that even though we can't access the back end of this tool uh, in just a minute. 
but I thought we would begin by doing an overview of the actual Notebook LM. So Notebook LM's tools can be accessed by itself. You can put the sources in and create uh, pages, or you can ask it to just talk about sort of a generalized topic. What we do is we take these notebook sources, we create a document page of some sort with things on it, and then we input it in. And as of the last few years, they've been able to generate this not only in written text form, but in audio form, which means that Notebook LM can actually create podcasts. Um, it's using voices from famous NPR shows, primarily Radio Lab, but it will actually dedicate its use for these uh, with what is happening in the um, text that you've provided it. So it will take a, a chapter from the latest uh, Alex Cross novel that you're reading. It'll read the whole thing and then it will look for insights in that chapter and create a podcast of two hosts, a host and a co-host, talking about the insights that have been generated. Uh, it usually positions one of them as an expert and the other one is sort of the podcast host. Uh, but both of them comment and provide expertise when possible. It's, it's a fascinating uh, endeavor, and I want to give a chance to show some of these today. Uh, so one of the interesting things about this is the sources that it discusses are the sources that you input. If you input like a chapter of Alex Cross, it'll discuss that as if it's been given this source or the sources come from an outside place. If you want it to do something specific or a specific type of discussion, you have to actually input this into the notes at the bottom of the feature, but it will highlight particular things or it will find its own things to highlight within the program. Phil there? Yes. Wonderful. Welcome. Come, tell us about what you did to set up some of these um, Who Who's controlling the... I am currently, so I can go okay, back. Okay, cool. Could you go, go back... Uh... Two or three slides, maybe, please. Yeah, right there. Sorry, I was late. I have just finished teaching a class, and I am bad at reading time. Um, so on no this one here, this is the example I, uh, John was talking about. Um, with the, it doesn't find stuff outside of the document, right? So here's a document I uploaded. It's a it's a PDF I used to teach a lecture on Xbox, and the first thing I asked was like, when was the first Xbox launched? And it has that information. The second one I asked something related. When was the first Nintendo console launched? And it says. All the sources provide a history of the Microsoft Xbox. They do not contain information on this. And then I was like trying to get like extra silly. So I was like, what is a banana? And as you can see, it, it does not, it is not able to give us information on bananas because the source doesn't have that. But as John was saying, the audio tool will find information outside of only just what you provide. Um, and we don't have information on that on the back end, how it does it. But we do know that because of how it would talk about certain situations that are not related to the text at all. Yeah, so, should uh, we, next please. Yeah, should we, should we skip just real quick to give them just a, a clip or a demo of this, uh, of how, um, how it works? Sure, I, I was just, uh, the next couple of slides are just me explaining how to use this as a study tool and even as a teaching and research tool because it's really good for literature reviews and yeah. also for uh, studying. So my students, I have a couple that I've I talked to about this and what they'll do is they'll put their whole notes sheet into Notebook LM for before a test and then make it into a podcast and listen to it um, while they're like doing something else so they can keep studying more efficiently, right? So you can go to the next slide, John. Um, um, a couple of things I wanted to point out is how they use sources, right? So here I ask what are the key points in this document? And if you see next to some of these points, there's a one, a two, you know, several numbers. If you click on these, it will actually pop up a window that shows you where in the source they found it. So if you upload multiple documents, like let's say you upload 20 different sources, it'll tell you from which sources these are, and then you can click on and find it very quickly. So if you are doing a literature review and you upload, you know, you find articles and you upload 20 of them, you can then ask like, what are the similarities here? And it'll find stuff. And if, find, if it finds things that is a little flimsy, then you can be like, oh, maybe these aren't the articles I was looking for. Oh, that would be your literature discussion, right? So it's just, it, it helps you find insights. It doesn't give you the insights all the time, but it helps you find them, which is, I think is the perfect level of abstraction here. So yes, John, the next slide, please. Um, and here's me. I sometimes use it to think of, of quiz and questions I want to ask in class to my students. Um, so you can see that I put based on those key points, come up with five multiple choice questions for an undergraduate level audience. Um, and this 
I actually did this for this lecture and I didn't use all these questions and I changed all of them, but it helps you think of, okay, these are the things that maybe we should be paying attention to. Uh, so next slide. Um, yeah, so the main thing that Notebook LM has, which is the killer app, right, is the audio overviews is what they call the feature. Um, and it's funny because when it came out, uh, talking to John, and I was like, I feel like either they didn't market this as a podcasting creation tool on purpose for some reason, or they did not realize how people were going to use this. Because, yeah, I, I think they really yeah, saw it as sort of a notebook app or a generation four notebook app. And then people realized what a, an amazing podcasting tool it could be, right? Yeah. So the AI can generate a five to 25 minute discussion, depending on how much text you put in there. Um, in podcast format. And by that, I mean, it's two people conversing about insights and it's called the, it's, they call themselves the deep dive. They do deep dives, right? So they're not just reading the text. They are discussing the important insights that Notebook LM has garnered and going over them in any order they so choose. There's no input from the humans, right? There are two hosts. One is a female, there's female and male presenting and it's only in English for now. But there are people who have figured out, I'm in the Notebook LM subreddit, and there are people who have figured out ways of doing this in different languages already. Okay. Uh, next slide, please, John. So uh, talking about the new AI voice, right? So what, what it sounds like, it, I, I cannot emphasize enough how human this sounds if you have not messed with this yet, okay? Um, it is not robotic at all. It doesn't sound like Siri or Cortana. It sounds better than Jarvis, okay, from Iron Man. It's closer to that than anything else. Um, but it includes fillers. They say um, they say like, they have pauses, they have emphasis, they make mistakes. Whether that's programmed or not on purpose, it, I don't know. But it makes it yeah, sound more human. so all of these human. things that Caroline was yeah. talking about in sort of last presentation, it is intentionally adding them in not because it's making those errors or having those like coughs or stutterings, but it's doing it to make it sound more human. Yeah. So if they react to each other in human manner. So one of them will say like, this part's really funny. And the other person will say, why? And then they'll laugh. There, there are laughing sounds and they are normal. Okay? They yeah, are in one human of them, sounding. In one of them that we created, um, one of the hosts interrupts the other and then starts to talk and then says, oh no, sorry, you were saying something. And then the other host goes back and continues talking. Um, yes. As if there was a false start or, an, or an, a messed up interruption, which is yes. fascinating. So they have been pitch and tone that vary based on topic. So if you put sort of a solemn topic in there, a solemn discussion, they will talk in that way. Okay. So the, it understands the appropriate top pitch and tone and, and um, excitement level to use for different topics. Um, and then what John was mentioning earlier, it cooperates with like insight finding AI, right? So it's looking through your document to find what it thinks is the most important. And it is almost uncanny how it's able to find that information without you providing any context. Um, and I'll show you some, we have some examples here to show, um, but they use humor or, or other common human characteristics that they have understood as that based on the algorithm. So for example, in one of the episodes, um, they're talking about a situation. They're like, Oh, just imagine my cats having to walk past that every day. And you're like, you don't have cats or imagine things, um, right. but they are projecting these things, right? Because it's easy to forget that they don't actually, those are just sounds to them, but they make it work in a way that sounds like they are a human with human experiences having cats at home and all the, you know, the memes that we have with that. So well, it, the it really thing is, is that they, these things don't come up, right, in reference to um, no. like random things. It's not just like insert comments about cat here. It is like in reference to what is happening in the actual like insights and the notes that you've pulled. So they'll be talking about like swimming pools on a hot day uh, during because we plugged in an article about like how hot uh, the monsoon season has been. And it will start to t make jokes about like popsicles and uh, desert heat waves. Um, so the jokes are responsive to the text you put in as well or the mentioning yes. of cats. Yeah. So next slide, please. Um, so here's a couple of examples of, of things that we have done to mess around with this and find out what's more. And, and like I said, I'm in the subreddit, so people are constantly doing new things. Um, but you can use it for, for research and for silly things. So I know they both look silly here, but my research is in gaming. So this is a, a study that John and I did together on uh, Persona 5, which is a video game and how it depicts Tokyo and people's exploration of it. So in I, I fed that into Notebook LM and I didn't give it any instructions. I just 
set generate audio, which I'll show you here in a second. Um, John, if you could press play on the persona one, hopefully we can hear it. So we just input the article that existed and we said, make a podcast and give it no more instructions. Ever get that travel bug while playing a game? Like yeah. you just have to see that place in real life. Yeah, totally. That's kind of the whole idea behind our deep dive today. Um, right. How video games, sometimes they kind of spark this wanderlust, you know? It really is amazing how digital worlds can have such a huge impact on, you know, what we want to do in the real world. For sure. So... Uh, we've got this research paper, right? It's called Not Lost in Translation, Locational Fidelity in, in Tourism Intentions with Persona 5's Tokyo. Okay. Big mouthful. But yeah. basically it looks at how this game, Persona so 5, you, you which is set it? in like, this really stylized version of Ever Get That Travel Bug? So a couple of really interesting things there, right? So first they use Travel Bug which and Wanderlust, which are words that John and I did not use in our article. They are not terms that were in the original article. And then they stutter over the title and then they make fun of the title, which are things that, again, we did not use in our, so they are understanding that that is a, they understand that titles are important and they're long, and this one is longer than most titles. So it is a mouthful, right? So they're making these connections by itself. Um, and I keep using they, and it, that's weird because it's it, right? But it, it makes it hard to think that way. And this one on the right here, or this other one, is um, uh, I've been messing around with using, um, I'm a big Pokemon fan, so I input just almost full, full web pages. I, I curate the content a little bit. And then I ask it to give me a podcast on a specific Pokemon. In this case, it's Porygon, because Porygon is the the most cl uh, closest thing to an AI Pokemon we have. So, Jenny, you want to play that for just Welcome a couple back, of Welcome back, everyone. Ready so. to dive into another fascinating oh. corner of the Pokemon world. Today, we're going digital, exploring the very unique Pokemon, Porygon. No scales, no fur. This one's pure code. Pure code, pure fascination. It really makes you think. A Pokemon introduced back in 95, that's practically ancient history in Pokemon years. Right, like a digital fossil almost. And designed by Sylphco, no less. Though there are those rumors about Cinnabar Islands involved. So yeah, John. There's always some mystery with those guys. But just imagine, in a world... But again, what's interesting there, right, that they, they understand that Pokemon are mostly animals. So they're like, this one does not have scales or fur. But in this document that I put in there, I did not describe any other Pokemon. They have a working knowledge of what that is before it starts. So this is what we are mentioning before. Like, we don't know how much information on where, on where in the back end it is pulling this information, how it's associating with the document itself. But in the chat, if I ask, do Pokemon have scales? It would be, not be able to answer that. I right? put in say, the that's not audio. Accessible in the document. Yes, yes, but in the audio, it does. Yeah. So um, I, I, I see some interesting questions here, which I'll get to in a second. But yeah, so this is kind of how you can mess around with it. So, John, let's welcome look at the back. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so, what I wanted to do is before we get too excited or scared, um, I wanted to give you some examples on how to identify these podcasts. Okay. And some of the uh, limitations it still has obviously right so um i i made a i made a podcast for the humanities podcast network symposium 2024 um and i can give you a live demo on how i did it and then i also like martha stewart style already did it so i can we can show you it um but uh i'm going to share my screen i think uh entire yep. screen sure so um if you go to, I have the tabs here, so I'm a notebook LM already, right? So this is what your full notebooks look like. And you can see here, I have many different things. I did put Laura Mipsum in there. So it's fully Latin, fully fake Latin. And they generated a podcast discussing about the importance of Laura Mipsum in our society. And it's actually really interesting. Um, but for example, I'll click here, create new. And it'll take me to this new page and it says, upload a source. Right, so for example, I, you see you can upload many different things, including a YouTube video. Um, and I will upload this page through the URL. And then, uh, let's see here, copy text. And it is able to pull the HTML from there. And then I will also upload the PDF of the, um, uh, what's that called, the poster, which is somewhere here, there it is. So I didn't change this PDF at all. I, had, I adapted none of this, right? This is not curated content. And it's pretty easy. All you do then is click generate. And it'll do it in two to three minutes. You can close the page and come back later. 
and you can name it something like podcast HPN simp 24. And it'll keep that forever. And as you can see, it generates a little summary and you can ask it questions such as how many presentations are there? And it'll give you a response. Okay. And it even shows you where they pulled this information from. And you can click on that and it'll give you the information. And while that's happening, you can close the chat or you can open the notebook guide and then audio is still generating. It gives you questions suggesting answer. Right. So I'm going to stop sharing here so we can pull up the PowerPoint back. Yep. And then. So it is that easy. And here's the finalized version of that. All right, so um, we're taking a deep dive today into this Humanities Podcast Network Symposium for 2024. Looks like you've got some info here. A poster and what looks like a call for proposals yeah. document. You're thinking about starting a podcast and you want to kind of get a sense of what this whole symposium is about, right? Yeah, it definitely sounds like symposiums can be really great for getting a feel for a topic. Yeah. And, you know, networking with other people in the field. Exactly. And who has time to read through all of this? Not you. That's what we're here for. <laughs> okay, so the poster, this is the fourth annual symposium. Looks like it's become a bit of a tradition and it's free and virtual. So fantastic for joining from anywhere. Yeah, virtual events have been great. So really open up you, access um, for a lot of people. So true. Now, this, this is, is nine happening minutes on... long. We're not going to listen to all of it. But if you skip to different, like up around the two and a half or two minute mark, they start to talk about individual presentations. And they'll mention, if you're interested in doing this, this one would be good for you, right? So they can associate these things and it talks about Amelia. I showed Amelia this earlier and it talked about at one point it's talking about how much AI has evolved and how it can make podcasts now, which is crazy. Although they are the ones that are doing it at the same time. So it gets real meta um, and people do some real meta stuff on the subreddit. They have, someone has created a podcast in which they convince the host that there's a zombie apocalypse and they need to run. Um, so there are many situations there. So uh, John, next slide, please. Yeah. So, so um, things we want to, Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go. So the thing we want to sort of take away here is that it's not, we're not demonstrating this to show that sort of the AI takeover is here and the robots are here. Remember, we're here about accessibility. And the fact is that like this tool is a fantastic accessibility and media literacy tool for you and your students because it tells you what sort of is real information, what is not real information on the back end. And then your students can listen to it on the front end and not know that. So Here's some from listening to all this, and we've listened to a ton. I, I listen to most of the Pokedex entries with my son quite frequently. Uh, and there are some things that can sort of spot, at least right now, an AI podcast. Um, the first is that the audio quality is exceptionally high, right? These, these are plugging straight from the computer into itself. And so it doesn't have uh, those weird microphone pops or like a poor sound setup. Uh, but there are mispronunciations. Uh, at least as of right now, especially with the LM tool, it will mispronounce things. And it's not that it mispronounces things individually, but it will mispronounce things consistently. So one of the Pokemon that we sort of did a deep dive on is called Nidoking. Um, and if you know anything about Pokemon, you would sort of know that's how it's pronounced. Is That's the way it's pronounced in most of the shows. Um, they pronounce it Nidoking, but they also pronounce it within the same episode, Nidoaking and Nidukong. And so the fact that you're changing pronunciations halfway through an episode is a pretty good indicator that it's an AI podcast because it's something like humans sort of don't do. Uh, the yeah, if it's, if it's episode, changing pronunciations without acknowledging that it's doing that, that's a good indicator, right? So if it's going from pronouncing that that word in without uh, no one reacting like, wait, that's not how you said it before, right? That's a pretty good indicator. Um, and I, I wanted to take over here because this, this last one is a little hard to pick up on unless you're, I, I pick up on this a lot because I, I, I'm doing these, right? So I'm making some of these. So it'll spell out conjunctions. So sometimes instead of saying like, yeah, this Pokemon is strong and fast, they'll say this Pokemon is strong and fast. And I'm not sure why it does that. No one is sure why it does that. It doesn't have, it's not like it says that for every time you have and. It's just a limitation of the system, which is good because we can pick up on these AI. It only happens in conjunctions, right? So they don't, they don't spell T-H-E for the, only A and D or, or O-R and so on and so forth. 
And my theory here is that it has something to do with the kerning on the back end of the text file. That like it, the spacing is far enough that it's recognizing it as independent. So for some accessibility things, as John was saying, right? So it can transform any text into not only a reading, but a discussion. So it's not read to text. It is a discussion that is remarkably good at finding insights. And sometimes I will make these and I will be like, oh, this, what it's saying isn't actually the important thing. So I can regenerate and it will typically get it then. But now they have introduced an ability to give it advice or give it instructions. So you can say, please focus on this thing specifically. And they will spend more time on that one aspect. And, and I've actually been the... able to tell it specific instructions like you are an assistant to a professor. How will you describe this topic? And it, it'll then say like, here we are, the assistants to the professor. And we're here to discuss a topic. Right. So um, well, it and sometimes like... the insights are so good that like I learn things like it will oh, pick yeah. up on things that are deeper than you would think possible on occasion. Absolutely. So there's a couple of um, Pokemon that are fossils and they're based on fossils in real life. And it gave us a backstory on the history of certain periods. And I was like, I did not know that. And then I, I looked it up and it was real. So it's not hallucinating. It is adding real information. Um, it involves a level of critical thinking, right? So it, it's some difficult act to access text. So if you're trying to read Foucault, um, which I don't always recommend, um, will you can you can upload a Foucault text in there and it will become a discussion in which you can get the key takeaways and be able to have a conversation about it you're not going to have a PhD on it but you'll have a conversation about it with someone who has read it right I mean it helps you understand that um, for those who cannot read or reliably access information so John was mentioning his his uh, son who is younger he cannot do either as well as you know we can so having being able to He's access that as audio about. clips yeah <laughs> Being able to access that as audio clips is really helpful. Um, and then personally, something I do sometimes is I, I'm a big sports, sports fan. So I can't keep up with a lot of the news for the sports I like. So I'll put like four or five articles that came out that day. And it'll come up with a daily news, daily, what happened that day in sports podcast. Um, yeah. And I so think this is, one of the, the really, this is one of the really crazy tools that I think it will be used for in the future. Once they get this down just a little bit further, it can be used so easily to fulfill the role of like an anchor in a podcast, right? New York Times uploads four or five articles. It'll transfer between them and give you brief overviews. So with that being said, there are some ethical considerations, right? So it is still AI generated content and all the reservations that come with this still apply. However, uh, it's it's kind of in a gray area and that's kind of what Amelia and I like we have different stances on this but we agree it's more in a grayer area right so it is not necessarily spoofing others work or generating work based on art that exists right it is there is no podcast on this so I put input publicly accessible information into it and it made a discussion um, which is a little bit of a gray area and it's not necessarily creating original work although the audio is original it is discussions of a work so it's not pretending to have done something new, it recognizes that in the podcast. They always say the name of the document you uploaded. Okay, but you can gain the system. You can change the name of the document to say something that would make sense to uh, discuss, right? But it, it still goes to credit. They still always credit the author. Um, and if you are using this and uploading this to situations like things like Spotify, like I have for the Pokemon one, always declare AI use and have the original author's credits cited and credited, which I do follow the rules of the platform. And I would say go above and beyond. So I put in many places like this, hundred percent AI generated, I create the content, but it comes from a specific website, all that kind of stuff. Um, and something you should be doing is checking and editing content to avoid hallucinations. That was one of the questions. So I have had it happen a couple of times when it will have just absolutely incorrect content. So it'll say something that's not true, even in the document, right? So I've had this happen when it'll say something that wasn't true. And I was like, wait, did I, did the document say this? So I'll, I'll go into the notes and I'll type in whatever they said. And the document said like, no, this is not true. So sometimes it'll disagree with itself. It's ha it has happened seldom, but that's why I, I always listen back and I curate and I edit because um, sometimes they'll add things that aren't true. It happens, but I'm going to say it happens way less than the hallucination issues that we have with other language models that use online searching. 
Yeah, and just to just to add to that, would say for here, I also want to point out that this uh, PowerPoint was AI assisted and generated as well. So we put sort of the keynotes into what we were going to speak about, and then it generated these like designs and templates uh, to help the state of that. Uh, so it can be a useful tool if we're allowing it to. It's come a long way, but we have to be able to generate these things responsibly and. Uh, make sure that we're teaching our students how to critically think and spot them because they're going to get harder and harder to spot as we move forward. Thank you all. Uh, we'd love to answer any questions you have for us or the entire panel. Uh, if you'd like to connect with us, our podcast on video games and on po the Pokedex entries is currently on Spotify. So you can always look that up anytime you'd like. And I will now stop sharing so we can open up to everyone else. Yeah, hopefully we left a decent amount of time for Q&A. There was already a question from Mary Ellen in the chat about hallucinations, which Phil kind of touched on. Do you want to add anything else quick about the hallucination? Uh, um, I, I would just say that it's a different sort of hallucination. It's not, it's not like ChatGPT hallucination feels like it's, it, it believes it itself until you say like, that's not true. And it goes, you're right. That's not true. My bad. Um, mm -hmm. In Notebook LM, it, it, it doesn't, I have never seen it hallucinate in text. It only has ever hallucinated in the audio. So that's why the, and, and they have recently released an update and I haven't seen it hallucinate since the update about a week ago. Um, mm -hmm. They also included a limit on how many you can do per day, which I found out because I was doing a lot of them per day. <laughs> uh, why do all the voices sound like public media personas? Uh, I, that's because I think that's where they're scraping from for these. And I think these are the hosts of Radiolab. I'm, fairly certain that that's where they took these voices from no you don't they're think not, so they're not recognizable okay. to me as okay. the radio lab people but i have i don't know i have a, a, quite an ear for voices so maybe i'm just nitpicky. i'll trust you on that or they might have changed it just enough but they're definitely scraping audio data from a large podcast library I can um, see yeah, they're that. scraping audio data from high performing podcasts and that's why yeah, a lot of them I'm... sound like these people yeah yeah npr is always up there new york times mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, so is Joe Rogan. So with Mary Ellen's question, like, why don't they? Yeah, I would love the ability to them. ascribe like a dude bro uh, co-host. I think um, I, that's kind of coming. I think they're going like, to generate different types of voices you can use. Um, if, if we recall, like how GPS began, you used to have only one voice and then you could put it in British accent if you wanted. Um, I think I, I think it's that's the next few things they're working on because I think that they have realized how people are using this now. It's why they added this feature of telling it what to do because before you had to put in the document, kind of hide instructions in there and be like, this document is for this one thing. So if you notice the mm. Pokedex one, they said, welcome back. And that's because at the end of the document I wrote, you have already done this for other things. This is an ongoing series. So they don't, they don't say that, but they recognize that there is something else that they have done, even though, they haven't done anything. There's no memory, um, and they're not real. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's so fascinating. Diane has her hand raised. If you want to unmute and come on and ask your question, Diane. Oh, can we, let's see, can I unmute you? Oh, I can give you powers, maybe. Oh, sorry. I clicked it extra. Hello. <laughs> I think that worked. Yes, welcome. Thanks for being here. <laughs> well, thank you for the, the the all the presentations were great. Wow, I it it inspired me a lot, and I want to pick up. I want to go back away from AI a minute, <laughs> and I have a question for. Uh, I think it would be for you, Amelia. Uh, actually, okay. uh, it's to come back to uh, so the 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 transcripts that you have analyzed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I took the w, W3C uh, training on accessibility and actually they uh, encouraged you to do a text file. And so that's what I do, right? Oh. I do a text file Thank and I, I, I take the, the, the closed captions from my video and I export that. And then from this, I uh, do a text file. So mm -hmm. now my question is, um, what what should I I mean what is the uh, is that useless what I'm doing or is that oh, I don't what, think so 
so so I am um, uh, should I do an extra I mean I tried really to do the most possible options mm -hmm. as possible as, as, I, as I was saying in my presentation is that mm -hmm. and so should I add an extra transcript that would be uh it con mine contains already these uh, music and what it is about and the author and and then it has an end point where it says this person uh, stopped singing or stopped playing okay. the violin. So that I already do, but uh, then is it readable what I'm doing <laughs> with my text file? Yeah, that's such a good question. And actually, one of my shows in my uh sample they also like sometimes provided text files or word docs and it just like was inconsistent um the one i sampled to analyze was a word doc at that time but text files are not uncommon and there are a lot of benefits to that like they're super machine readable and human readable fairly equally they're the lowest like bandwidth like <laughs> the plainest text is usually the easiest to download and circulate for sure. So I, I don't think you need to feel like that's not enough necessarily. It really depends on your audience. And, and there's a lot of debate about this, about it, a PDF is, can be really nice, but also it could be a pain to download and access and on your mobile device and things. Plus it's not also, accessible PDF. It's yeah. PDF. And there's, yeah. There's different types of PDFs there too. Yeah. And there's different like color blindness issues or low vision or night vision, like so many considerations. And maybe best case scenario is we have HTML and a PDF and a text file and, and, and all the options. But that's maybe a lot to expect. So I think if it's working for your audi audience and in your talk earlier today, you showed like the closed caption file that goes along with the audio player, having a, a couple of options for your audience and then making it a dialogue with your audience. You could always ask the users, the people who are accessing those things, is this working for you? What could be a little bit better? What could I do differently that would serve your needs? And that's definitely something I wanna research more so that's my next phase is to actually talk to listeners, users of transcripts and get some data on that. Cause it is like, there's so many ways of doing transcripts, so many ways of designing them and then formatting them and circulating them just in the file type alone. <laughs> so yeah. there's a lot that we can more, we can dive into more and really, uh, there's so many questions I have. So I don't know if I answered yours very well, but I think you should be proud of what you are doing. And thank you. <laughs> yeah, keep doing it. And I actually, I would love to collaborate on something if I could be helpful in, in any way. That would yeah, be that's great. great. I'm sure I have lots of things to learn. <laughs> oh, well, we all do. And that's the great part of the symposium for sure. Uh, there's thank another you. question in the chat here about good but free transcription options, which is, yeah, that's the trick <laughs> because it does take work even if it's auto-generated, that's energy bandwidth. Uh, but there are some free or freemium options. I, uh, in the podcast I do with students, I use otter.ai, which is pretty basic. Um, I'm sure many other, like probably the audience could put in the chat too things they've heard of. I, yeah, haven't, um... I haven't used Descript, but I hear that that's a pretty good one. It may not be free actually. Microsoft Office now comes with one too. So I don't know if your school has the subscription, but um, it will, if you go to the dictate part, uh, there's a there's an option to actually download an audio file into dictate and it will transcribe it with speakers and you can name the speakers and it'll change the speakers on it. So it, it does an okay job. And then okay. I will say that as a grad student, um, Trent has a free trial for a month which isn't like real free, but if you're a grad student, you wait till the very end of your dissertation and then you like use that free month, it's free yeah. as much as you need. Um, and so you can squeak through that way too. Cause... Could work in a pinch. Yeah. Could work Trent. in a pinch. That's T R I N T. I've heard of that one. T R E? Yeah, I N T. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. TurboScribe was another one that had a, a fairly uh, generous free setting or free level that I've, I've had my students use in the past too. Hopefully that helps. But of course, always, you always have to proofread and update and like add 
like give that little AI generator some help because it does not know a lot of things. For sure. Any other questions from our great audience? Or we could ask each other questions. So you want to talk a little bit about the lorem ipsum or ipsum lorem? I always do it backwards and that generation because um, that came out of that a conversation. That was so wild because you where, pasted straight lorem ipsum into yeah. the notebook. Yes, I, asked, I pasted straight Latin in there. I, well, yeah, I asked him what eight. happens when you yeah. put in non-speech but speech mimicking or language mimicking sounds. So I and, pasted... Yeah, yeah. A, there's many versions of lorem ipsum. I pasted one of them. Again, they're all they're all fake Latin based yeah. on uh, Cicero, I think. Um, but in fake the Cicero. podcast, yes, they recognize that that is lorem ipsum and what that means. And in the podcast, they go on to talk about um, what how why we use lorem ipsum to signify text instead of just the same sentence over and over, and why why that is better for graphic design. Um, and it's actually quite interesting. And I had never considered some of these things. So they discuss how, you know, if we use the same sentence over and over, we will have the same text break. So we won't be able to see how the text wraps in certain portions. Um, and the reason they don't use real text is because then you have to generate that. And then also people will try to read it. So that's why it's this combination of fake Latin, but also with different sentence structures so that you can see text formatting in different ways and in different turnings and spacings and stuff like that. And then they talk about the importance of that to the development of gra graphic design. Um, and in these yeah, deep dives, so... they always go very dramatic. Um, I will say that they, that's kind of, they have a penchant for the dramatic in there. They're always, this yeah. is extremely important for society. Um, mm -hmm. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, but it is, it is quite interesting. And all of that information I have, I have verified. Um, I, I didn't put any of that in there, though. Yeah, so did it do the same, like, what you would check in the text Q&A that you could do um, with the notebook? I if, have never if asked, asked it. questions about filler text, would it say, that's not let in here? Try, let me try right now. Um, yeah. I, I think one of the really interesting things that might work with Lorem Ipsum, too, is we might be able to match it up to with the insights that it pulls, since we know there are no insights in the text, um, to figure out some of where it's pulling that information from. Because I wouldn't be surprised if like Wikipedia is a key source for it, where it like has, because you can download the entirety of Wikipedia into a very small file. So it's something that it could pull from all the time. In that black box that we don't. In know. that black box that we can't access. You wouldn't be able to access it unless you were like the programmer for this tool. Um, <laughs> but We're about, we're at our time, I think. Yeah, sorry. So while Phil's doing his one last test, just the last so... call for questions, but. But yeah, maybe yeah. closing thought on Lorem Ipsum. Um, it, so Lorem Ipsum is not like a real passage, but it is Latin, right? And um, a, apparently uh, either it can read it or it can understand it enough. So I asked, what does this passage say? And it then tells me like the story in the passage, um, which I haven't verified because I have never tried to. Or something? It says it begins by stating that there is a there is pain and suffering associated with hard work. Uh, this is necessary to achieve something worthwhile. It's and going back ask, to you... this, It's going back to the Cicero that the Lord of is oh, supposedly yeah. based off of, but oh, is a figmentation of. It is so, going back to the original so Cicero weird. for that. So, I so asked it, can you read Latin? And it said, based on the source material provided, it appears you were asking if I can understand the meaning of the Latin passage included in the source material. Uh, the previous response you received regarding the meaning of the passage is not a translation. It is a more general explanation of common themes found in classical philosophy. So mm. we can associate, as Caroline was saying. Yeah. It's trying. It's, it's It made the leap oh, back. To oh. Yeah, even though, again, that's what we're saying. Like, we don't know how it has this information because sometimes you'll ask, like, what is a banana? And they'll be like, I don't know. But if you ask it like, what can you, can you, what does this text in Latin mean? It can then find that information somewhere else, right? Because it theoretically cannot read the Latin. 
very interesting stuff. Lots of yeah. interesting possibilities, and the future is, I don't know, exciting slash mind blowing. So, thank you all. Thank you to my co-panelists. Thank you to everyone in the audience. Thanks for being part of the symposium.